though that would include not just tuition and services but also um, residential living um, so that would be a, a cost of about four hundred sixty two thousand dollars which would be an increase in in service of about one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars from what we're currently kind of um, per, uh, utilizing for um, services um, and you know just with thoughtful planning and, and and again all of the review that we've done um we we were able to make um some adjustments of close to 600 a little over six hundred fifty nine thousand dollars. so again you know just know that we are every day keeping an eye on what's happening making adjustments as needed sometimes it's going to work out in in the favor of the budget and other times it's not but um it's just that's the world of special education. So that's our budget. Scott, can we ask questions? Absolutely. Yeah, this would be um, a good time to ask questions. We'll stop at the end of each of the um, presentations and open so, it up to the board questions. So Chris Christine, this is Judy. Thank you so much for that. I, I feel like that was really um, clear and helpful. And I absolutely love that you said for budget reasons, you know, um, with students. I just have a question because I can only see a little bit right now on my screen. With the student who will go residential, the budgeted amount that you figured, did you um, factor in excess cost for that? Because you'll be, as you know, reimburse money for that student. So for the budget, did you factor that in or, or not yet or? So not yet. And, and without right. getting into too much detail, this is a, a potential. So. Um, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. And that's no, I, I, I hear you. And I think and I really appreciate your presentation. It was so um, helpful. And, you know, I think as we go on as a board, what we um mm -hmm as it gets tighter and tighter with the budget, a lot of times what we might ask you and Eva to do is, and I don't even know what the formula is right now, if it's four and a half times per pupil and then 80% of that or something, but you get a significant amount back. And so like not at this presentation, but it's, it's helpful to know that excess cost as we start getting really, really tight in a probably a month or so. But thank you. That was great. Thanks. I guess that was me, Steph. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. <laughs> um, I, I just want to echo uh, what Judy said about the excess costs. It seems like we, we have uh, big tidal waves regarding, you know, how much we're getting for excess cost. And then when it comes in, we got a big surplus like we've had the past few years. Um, so I'd like to see if we could really uh, try to get a, a firm handle on that to help us with the uh, with the budget projections. Um, second thing is just a question. Um, how do these numbers stack up against last year's enrollment? Because I know going into last year, I thought we had a, a, a sizable decrease. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, is this still a decrease again this year or are we kind of flattened out? Are you talking about the number of number of students and getting service? You, you um, are you overall or out of district programming? If you if you have the numbers for both, like you broke it down to the the twenty six, eighteen, and and then eight, and then the six magnet, is that comparable to last year? If you don't know yeah. it, you can get back. Okay. Yeah, that's about even because between the, the three students that came in and the two that have left the district, we're about even with where we were last year for that. And were we able to move any um, any of the out of district or magnet back into our program in house? Any students? Thought, yeah. Um, we have not had we have not had any students returned to district recently. Okay. It is something that we continually re review and work on, but just hasn't. And, and I remember as we have students who reach that um, transition age, a, a post-secondary education, mm -hmm. you know, it's really best for those students to move on in some capacity um, so that, you know, they have the best opportunities they can before they reach adult services. So um, that plays a fact, you know, is a factor as well. 
Thank you. And j just to add to that, Finn, you know, a lot of the, the, the STEP program and the resilience program, you know, those, those programs often prevent students from moving out of the district. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not always a, a matter of, are we bringing students back? But the question is also, are we, are we preventing having to send students out? And so I think those programs have done a nice job in, in helping us in that area. I have a quick question. The um, the age 22 um, budget, the 379 that you think will cost us um, less this next year, has that been calculated into the budget yet? Or are we still waiting to for that to firm up before we um, calculate that into the budget? So Scott, I believe that's that the adjustments have been made on our end, but obviously they have not been reflected yet in in um because it just happened recently so we have made those adjustments um to our budget requests um you'll you'll see those in a few minutes stephanie when we do the adjustments to the budget okay thank you are there any others stephanie, yeah. oh, go yeah. ahead, Kathleen. no go ahead joe i'm fine uh I'm going through the budget book and pardon me, this is, uh, I haven't looked at this uh, other than tonight, unfortunately. Um, so piggyback, maybe just tell me, so la what is our budget for the overall budget right now? Is it the 3 million, 2, 12, 576? That would be the previous amount i believe although i have that's on page 20 of the of the book we got over the weekend if, uh, just fyi so that's where i'm pulling the number from i see three million two twelve in red that's the personnel that's yeah. only personnel and how does and how does that number right. how does that number stack against last year and we're and I apologize again, where do I find that number? You have, Joe, if you, you can see um, on the second column of that on page 20, it lists the adopted budget from this year. And then the third column is the proposed budget for this for next year. And then the differences are in that last column. Okay, but there's no total, so I I have to uh, I add all these numbers up, and that's that's a difference in from correct uh, yeah previous year. Okay, all right, that was my so question. I, Thank. You. Yep, I will say that our our budget with the adjustments we just made is coming in lower than what we were at last year. It okay. will not look that way now, but it will once Scott gives you the new numbers. And, and the other question I had was I I was. I had a phone call come in when you were giving your presentation. So I, the age 22, uh, how does that, you're saying we're, we're getting a decrease and uh, I, miss, I must have missed that. So how are we getting a decrease? Um, we originally were planning for a full year of services, just not knowing where the law was going to end up. So we were planning for full years of services for all eight students that had out of district programs who were affected by this, by this ruling. Um, after some legal and, and professional consultation, we decided to pull back um, that we were, it was safe to pull back to just when their age, their 22nd birthday is. Some of those students were in September, October, November. So that significantly impacted what we were budgeting. Um, and we were able to um, have that cost savings of about $379,000. So that's a cutoff as, as uh, that matches the, um, the, the, the school year. That's a, cut off that matches what the current state guidance is, which is when the student turns 22. Whereas previously the guidance has been that services end at the end of the school year in which they turn 21. So these students would have exited at the end of this school year, which means we wouldn't have had to plan for any more services for them. But because of the new guidance, we have to continue to plan those services, which excludes summer planning as well as um, is regular school year planning until they turn 22. So if a student turns 22 in February, they end in February, they're no, they don't go to June? 
if their birthday is February 9th, their services end on February 8th. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And Christine, does adult services at that point pick them up? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So they get picked up, Joe, by the kind of the next agency in that chain of services. That's good. And at that point, our obligation, our, our financial obligation, there always be our students, so we want to see them do the best that they can, but our financial obligation ends at that point. Okay. And that number again, Christine, was roughly what did you say, 379? Roughly 379, a little tad bit under, a couple dollars. But. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, Christine, this is Kathleen. Hi. Hi, thanks for all you do. I know it's a, uh, um, like you said, it's fluid, <laughs> um, especially in the a year where you're not you're not quite sure if you're in or you're out or what other places are doing. Um, I totally understand that, and I know you never know about excess costs. That'll we'll have to wait to see what happens. I right. just have a quick question about the uh, twin dip of the time uh, time with non disabled peers. I remember we talked about that last year, mm -hmm. and there was some um, discussion about changing some programming. Mm -hmm. um, has the time with non-disabled peers percentage changed at all this year? Are you able to even calculate that because of the hybrid model and all that? Yeah, so the current situation makes it a little bit challenging. Um, you know, and unfortunately, this, as, as you probably are aware, the state data that comes out is a couple years behind. So um, we're, we're just doing our best to um, maintain our, our current um, we, you know, as we, we discussed last year, our, our co-teaching is very strong. Our co-teaching relationships are very strong. We feel strongly that really helps support students, but we, we are continuously trying to figure out more creative ways to support students using that model, but also promoting independence and, and ready and based on readiness and things like that, that can help, um, increase that percentage, um, so it is a work in progress. Uh, this year has definitely um, not helped with with trying to um, spearhead that. But um, as as we're a little bit in survival mode right now, but we are as we write IEPs for next year, continually having that in mind as we program for students. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that you're still utilizing the co-teaching yeah. model and that's working um, mm -hmm. for you guys. Um, thank you for that update. Great. Any other questions for Christine? Okay. I'm going to go back sharing my screen. Thank you, Christine. Thanks, Christine. And we're going to move into technology with Scott Butson. Hi everyone, uh, Scott Putson, Director of Technology. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of you know some of the goals, the driving factors of the budget, and then some highlights of you know some things that we did accomplish throughout the year. So to start with our goals, uh, even during COVID, uh, we are striving to continue to grow the district. Um, it was a difficult year, but we came. We developed some goals that we feel that will still move the district forward. <laughs> so we are focusing on strategic uh, goal number five. And our first goal really focuses around communication, and I won't outline every single um, goal that I have, but the main focus is to, commun to communicate to the, the uh, community more effectively, so either through social media or we, ha we have built a plan and we'll be releasing a public communication, communication plan of how we, as uh, the leaders of the district, communicate to parents and the community. Uh, goal number two is really focused around our department and how we can improve the things that we do every day. So, you know, how can we monitor and track student Chromebooks a little more effectively? Um, a big one on the on the top right now is more around, you know, how can we alleviate any kind of cybersecurity threats? So this, over the past two years, we've installed a, you know, higher end um, Palo Alto firewall. And we also inst installed the end user client software, which really focuses on protecting the end user from any malware that could get in. And goal number three, you know, focuses on the instruction. Um, you know, along with Eric Nunes and I, we try to build resources and 
push into classrooms and virtually now um, and really build out resources that teachers can use to help with their instruction. Um, we've really built out the instructional technology site and the technology site to have a place for staff and community members to go to get information related to technology that helps them move things forward. Uh, next slide. So these are really our budget driving factors. Uh, we didn't see any really um, substantial decreases in the budget. Everything pretty much stayed the same except for the things that you see on this page. <clears throat> so we're gonna continue with our life cycle lease package. Um, and you'll see this in the next slide, I'll outline the package. But on page 29, there's a graph that outlines where we're trying to get with the lease package. So in, in 2023, uh, 23, 24, we should have this line to an even line where we will never have to increase the line again unless we want to um, be able to implement more equipment into the district. So that's what I've been trying to do over the next the last uh, two and a half years, and we're, we'll be there in 23-24. Um, um, we're going to finish uh, replacing all the aging switches throughout the entire complex. We've already replaced the core switching. Um, in the high school, in our main closet, and we'll finish with 50,000 this year, we'll finish the implementation of that project. And the rest of the items really focus around software. And we've been trying to streamline our software process over the years um, and really understand what teachers are using in the classroom and what they need in the classroom. Some of these at the top, the top three are somewhat COVID related. Uh, Schoology is the platform that they're using set uh, I like with Google Classroom, but it gave them a little more in the assessment area. So we were looking at Schoology to implement more strategic assessments for students. And number two is um, Google Enterprise, which does help in a COVID situation, but it also helps in some of our backend reporting that Google lacks with, without paying for the enterprise version. When you're going with the free version of Google, um, you, you're missing some of that reporting and features capability. But along with that did come some extra meet functions, such, a, such as breakout rooms and, and a few different um, features like that, but more around um, reporting for us. And then the third one is to give teachers another option for how they instruct uh, the students. So we were, we're gonna, we we're budgeting for the full uh, Zoom Education Pro for teachers. <clears throat> And then the next one we have been using all through COVID and before we before COVID started, we we use securely to really filter students at home. And we're also using us uh, going to begin using securely to help students virtually so the teacher can see what they're doing and help them more effectively than not being able to see what they're doing on their devices. Uh, the, the Swank product is to help uh, teachers be able to play any kind of um, movie that's out there legally. And we really focused on this because we did, we are moving away from DVDs and things like that and trying to go more online. So with this product, they can really see all the major motion pictures uh, legally and play them in the, in the school. And Cami teachers um, really wanted a piece of software that they could mark up PDFs um, virtually and, you know, just for normal instruction. So that piece of software will help them do that. And that's partially grant funded. And the full amount was 4,400 for the year, but we'll supplement some of that with grant funding. And Screencastify was a big one that everyone really wanted. And the dollar amount for the district license compared to the individual license did not make sense at all. So for 1650, we were able to get everyone Screencastify in the entire district, whereas I believe it was $100 per license the other way. And this allows teachers and anyone that's in the district to be able to screencast and record their screen actions and be able to save that in a shareable format so that um, you can see what they were doing on their screen. Um, next slide. So this is the... Uh, the 2021-22 lease package that we're proposing. So this again would only be a $60,000 payment in the budget. So we're gonna replace again, seventh grade and 10th grade comrades, which we've impl implemented a three-year replacement process for that. 
these devices will have a four year um, accidental coverage on them. And then we're gonna replace all the computer labs in the art department. So that's um, three Mac labs. We're gonna replace aging uh, art department teacher laptops, which are nine laptops. We're trying to move away from the smart board projector model um, as projectors require bulbs to replace constantly and reduce some costs there where uh, with these classroom LCD touch panels, um, these have a life expectancy of 10 years. So this would be a, a big replacement for smart boards and projectors. And then we're focusing on replacing some of the very old uh, media center desktops that are still running some Windows Seven's machines. <laughs> And then we're gonna look at a couple um, administrative laptops that are, are due for replacement. And what I always like to do is kind of highlight some of the things that we did do. Um, you know, we always say what our goals are, but I really like to focus on what, what we did do last year. So we did con continue to develop the t uh, technology coaching model with Eric Nunes and really help have him help teachers with instruction. <laughs> We're developing an innovation plan with an innovation team um, that kind of fell apart a little bit at the end of the year because we were pushing hard to get a plan together. But then when COVID hit, we kind of uh, pulled back a little bit just because we had so many other things to focus on. Um, we continue, like I said before, to develop a comprehensive instructional resource site and technology site to notify and give, uh, provide information to people. We integrated Family ID this year to try to move some of that paper items paperless. So like parking application, instead of doing a paper form, we move that into a paperless form. Uh, again, we replaced all the core switching to strengthen our network. And then it, we deployed the Palo Alto client software to help with cyber threats at the end user level. And that's it, I'll take any questions. Any questions for Scott? Thanks, Scott, for your work. Uh, this is Vin. I just had a question about the lease. Um, we're seeing some drastic numbers with the reduction in enrollment. Um, do these leases take that into account? Because that 60,000 seems to run out to 2025. So I'm wondering, you know, with, with you know, 90 less students this year and, and 70 less last year and the numbers coming up, where are we taking that? decrease into account so when we get to the 20 if you on the graph when we get to the 23 24 school year we'll never have to add to that we'll have four for rolling four four year rolling leases all the time and whatever we determine we want to use with the funding so it's basically 240,000 then minus the finance charges but whatever you want to pull and push into that 240,000 you can so wherever we go with innovation we'll have the room to go there um, so if we have to reduce the amount of Chromebooks because of enrollment, we could move the, the funds into somewhere else. We just flex what we want to do that year, depending on, I mean, the Chromebooks pretty much drive the, the major amount of the money. Um, but as we see declining enrollment, we could, you know, push more LCD to replace the projectors faster, things like that. So you have a lot of flexibility there. Thank you. Stephanie, Joe, um, Scott, thank you. Um, just to piggyback on Vinny, so overall, that is going to be our 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 goal is to continue with this this funding level of sixty thousand per year for the foreseeable future. And within that, like you described, you're going to have um, avenues to expand on whether it's you know other other technologies. So that's that is that's going to be our continuation plan, correct? Yes, and, and eventually we'll get to a place where we you'll never see an increase in the budget again, but you'll be able to get the, um, the 240000 to, to buy additional equipment. You'll never lose the ability to buy equipment and never have to go back to the towns for, for additional lump sum of money. Like some, some districts go back to their towns, you know, for 300000 a year to do whatever technology items they wanted to do. And that and that's not a great place to be sometimes, especially in financially hard times when, you know, that's a, that's an easy place to go and say, you know, we don't actually need that stuff. We want to, you know, drive more instruction and move away from technology, you know. So it's kind of a, 
kind of good place to be with it. Yeah, that is. Uh, my my other question was um, when the, this uh, funding for teachers to look at. I'm just curious. Uh, can teachers, when you're looking at the students' work, is it's kind of like you know when you have IT help and someone shares your screen with your IT people. Is are we doing stuff like that with it? With, with teachers, uh, with students, where they can share a screen or no? The, so securely when, when we get, and this could be a whole nother conversation for a whole board meeting, but when we do implement securely, you can't, teachers can look at students' screens, but they cannot control students' screens. Um, students can raise hands or chat and things like that with the teacher, but they can't control their screen. Teachers can see what they're doing and that's it in a system. Okay, thank you. Um, Scott, this is Kathleen. Doug, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Just a quick question. You had mentioned about desktops in mm -hmm. the media center. With students having their own devices, uh, what are what is the usage of the desktops? Um, and are they up to date desktops? Or I'm just not wasn't sure. Having you know, can't get in the school, see why kids are using them. Is it still necessary for desktops? Yeah, it's one of the last pieces that we we focused on to replace. You know, we worked all the way from getting Chromebook Cycle in place, teacher laptops, you know, high-end computer labs. And now we're focusing on what we do in the media center. So we are, students do sit there some on occasion and they'll, you know, want to work at a desktop and do work on a lot, little larger screen. So we are, we are putting desktops back in the media center, just not as many as they have in there now. And they are really old machines. They're still running Windows 7 and, and antiquated. So at the high school, not so much. We, we only have print stations for them. But we find that the middle school students do like to go in there and sit at the actual desktop. Are we? Um, can they hook those up to their Chromebook so they can have a double screen if they need them? Or, you know, kids are often and now have to multitask, look at what's on Google or Schoolology, plus do the work. Um, does it give them the capacity to do that if they want to? Yeah, they could probably um, dual screen when we get the new monitors and, and desktops in place, yes. Thank you. Sure, thanks. I had a question, Stephanie, if that's okay. Um, Scott. Thank you so much. This is really thorough. I can see everything laid out. Um, for the software, I just had a question on those top three line items that you said were primarily as a result of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. So is is that sort of, if we, if we have sort of a normal, typical school year next year, um, do those uh, line items go away? Do they get reduced? Are they staying regardless? Um, do you have any thoughts about about that, I know it's hard to plan for that today. Yeah. I mean, I mean the Google um, Enterprise. I would, I would suggest that we keep that in there just for the reporting purposes alone. It does give us a lot of more visibility into things that are going on in the network um, and on on the platform. Um, the other two, I would, I would hesitate to. And I don't know what's normal anymore, so I would hesitate to reduce those at this point, but. Because um, we just don't know what next year, next year is going to look like, and, and a lot of teachers do like to use Zoom, and I think if we had that available for them, they would a lot more would go on to it because it's a little you know a little more user friendly platform. But but yeah, I hope that answers your okay. question. <laughs> no, thank you. So that's a possibility. If if we don't need those, those would be you know planned for it. But then if there's a possibility that we may not need it. Lori, <laughs> just a kind of piggyback on that. Um, this morning, the URSA, the, the, the superintendents on the eastern part of the state, we met with our state legislators. Um, and one of the, the first challenges we posed to them is we, we need to know what the expectation for school districts will be next year. So we're all planning on a full and more traditional return to school the the kind of unknown for us is will the state still allow families and students to choose to be remote if that's the case then these programs become critical um, in allowing for that um, obviously if the state says the remote option is no longer on the table then that 
simplifies that portion of our work significantly and we may not need those. So I think until we have a good sense of what that might look like, mm -hmm. uh, it would be tough to eliminate any of those at this point. And, yeah. uh, you know, when we might learn what the uh, what the final answer on that is, your guess is as good as mine at this point. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're right, especially with the transition over at SDE right now. But yeah, I, I agree. I think it's important to plan for that so that there aren't any crises that come up last minute that hinder instruction because um, it is running very, very well. You know, my son's a distance learner and it's working well. So it'd be great to have to plan for that should we need to, although I'm sure we all hope not. So thank you. Yeah, I'm really proud of how successful RAM was to, to move to virtual learning and how well the teachers have done too. It's been pretty phenomenal. So this is Jean, and uh, I'm, I'm asking more or less the same question. So are these one-year contracts or flexible contracts? How did you, how did the contracts come out from these that you could maybe not have them next year, but have them this year? They're year-to-year -year contracts. Okay. We would we would sign on in July first, and then it would go to June thirtieth of the next year. Yeah, I would think for some of them, you're going to have your instructors make a hefty investment of their, uh, you know, energy learning them, maybe building assessments out in Schoolology mm -hmm. or whatever that they might want to continue using, having put that investment in. Yeah, agree. And I think Gene, that's a really interesting point because we have put a lot of a lot of money and time and blood and sweat into learning a lot of these new, um, whether they be how to how to effectively use a software package or how to deliver it, how to integrate it within your your instructional practices, and you know there some of this will continue on through next year. I mean, the, there are lessons to be learned that are going to enhance what we would consider just traditional in school. Um, learning. So, you know, we may find that even though we're not using them in the same way we're using them this year, but when we're back to normal, we find that some of these um, programs we wouldn't have otherwise used may have some significant learning benefits for our kids. So, yeah, agree. <clears throat> some of that could just be um, in the special ed department too, looking at school avoidance and keeping those kids or credit recovery or um, even kids who need support and intervention and possibly looking at tutors or paying people to support kids after school. I mean, there's so many variations now. It's, it's, it's incredible. And it's time to do it, actually. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that we should move away from traditional schooling, but it does offer us other things that help um, our learners be good, productive adults. Yeah, it definitely opened our eyes to what's you know possible out there. <clears throat> Um, this is Jean again. I also just wanted to <clears throat> add support to keeping some of those desktops. I, I know in my lab, I have to have desktop uh, to, to do any kind of major video production stuff. You, you can't do those easily on a laptop because of the memory requirement and speed requirement. So we always have one hefty desktop for that. So just putting in a two cents to support that, keeping some of them. Yes, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Scott? Uh, Joe, uh, Scott, this is sure. Joe again. Um, I, I just think in listening to, you know, some of the board members and their comments, I, I think it's also critical for us to uh, point out, just listen to Scott say how, how well we did overall. And, and I think everybody's involvement, you know, it's a time and a place to say, I think teachers, because my wife is a school teacher doing fully remote, um, who has been challenged quite you know, daily on this. I think it's a shout out to our staff and to the administration and to Scott, make, you know, uh, Butts and keeping this going. It's been a remarkable year. And I think uh, it's, it's a, it should be noted that um, I'm sure every day there's been a new challenge for everybody that uh, in the IT world. So um, I, I really do think this is um, a, an opportunity to say thank you again for you know, everybody's success, because I think we've, uh, We've done very well. I know some people aren't happy with it, but unfortunately, uh, that's that's directed uh, by the state and COVID itself. But I think overall, we yeah, it's it's uh, it shows that we've staff is prepared and planned accordingly, and um, good dialogue to hear about the, what we're going to go into next year, why it's critical, 
uh, those are very important and um, uh, I support a lot of that. So thank you. Thank okay. you for your support. Okay. So we'll move on and we're going to move into facilities with Mike Schleyhofer. And okay, Michael. Thanks, Scott. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Schleyhoff, I'm the Director of Facilities. Uh, so the Facilities Department aligns with the following goals. Goal one is described as all students at, at Region 8 will have access. Excuse me, Mike, can we see, is, is it displayed somewhere what you're presenting? Can you not see it? I can't right now, but I switched devices. Maybe that's why. Okay. Can we I can ask? See you can. Okay. Yeah. So, Judy, it's on the screen. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. You can go on, Mike. All right. All students in Region 8 will have access access and um, actively engage in a variety of learning opportunities where they can experience growth and develop skills to be successful in college and or career as citizens in an ever-changing world. And goal five is described as enhancing facilities in order to support innovation and fully accessible teaching, learning, and extracurricular opportunities. Of course, in order to meet these goals, it's important that we maintain the school buildings, grounds, and athletic fields so that we can continue to build lasting partnerships with families and community members. This also helps to engage the community through the use of facilities, both in and outside, which also supports our theory of action plan by creating inter interactive learning spaces and extracurricular activities. Next slide. Some key driving factors in next year's operating budget. So custodial temp services has an increase by approximately $64,000 due to COVID. This will supply us with additional staff to disinfect high touch point areas throughout the facility each day. Custodial supplies have increased by approximately $52,000 due to possible full return in the fall. This would cover PPE for staff, students, such as hand sanitizer, wipes, face masks, gloves, and additional plexiglass if needed as well. Security equipment has an increase by approximately 14,000 as we're looking to install five cameras throughout the main kitchen and two serving lines. It has been identified that these areas are in need of cameras for safety and security reasons. Another one is um, food service equipment it has an increase by approximately $4,400. We uh, currently have seven portable refrigerators that are about 18 years old. We're looking to start purchasing one new unit a year to start phasing in new equipment into the kitchen. <clears throat> um, building sewer fees have increased $12,160 from the 1920 operating budget. Currently, Region 8 is billed 76 EDUs, which stands for Equivalent Dwelling Unit. In June of 2020, the Water Pollution Control Authority voted and approved a sewer fee increase on EDUs from 350 to 510 per EDU. Um, some decreases in the budget um, are as follows. Building inspections, even though there are some decreases in this account that um, equal about 13,000, we're still moving forward with our yearly inspections, which include the stage rigging system, 
backflow preventers on the water system, roofing inspection, safety eyewash and shower stations, fire doors, bleachers, both inside and outside, overhead doors, gym hoops, gym curtains, and fire suppression systems. Uh, looking at natural gas, at a three-year average, there's an approximately $13,500 decrease in this account. Um, another one is electricity has decreased by approximately $86,000. We um, finished paying off our energy loan for the HVAC retro commissioning project, and we have locked in a supply rate with a new vendor for the next four years, which has also helped lower this. Um, the high school is at a rate 56 and the middle school is at a rate 57 with Eversource. The amount budget also includes funds for the impending Eversource rate increase. Um, just some, I'm oh, sorry. Um, just some back back history on the solar system. So the high school produces 172 kilowatt and the middle school produces uh, 40 kilowatts. The systems combined produce an average of 288,000 kilowatt hours. Um, any solar that is produced and is not used is sold back to the grid basically. Um, another, another decrease is equipment repair and maintenance. We've been able to conduct a majority of the preventative maintenance on the equipment in-house, which has reflected a savings of approximately $3,400. All right, if you could go to the next slide, Scott. So the next slide illustrates the capital budget as recommended by the facility subcommittee. I'm gonna go through each line. Um, eco rolls for the high school gym floor. This will ensure that the gym floor is covered and protected for events that take place in the gym at a price of 27,500. The middle school guidance suite will be removing VCT in the broad loom carpet and will be replaced with new carpet squares and installed new cove base at a price of 16,490. Middle, uh, sorry, excuse me. Remove and replace stair treads in the seven stairwells in the middle school and replace with new rubber stair treads and cove base of a price of 76,500. Um, in the high school, the head end room and the lighting control room for the auditorium. These units are currently 18 years old. The cost associated with these project would be $50,000, which includes the engineering fees. Um, this is a uh, year three of the camera upgrade for our camera system. And we have $40,000 budgeted for that. Uh, moving outside, uh, we're gonna do the saw cuts in the tennis courts repair those for the amount of $15,000. And then also um, we're gonna install irrigation smart controllers for the athletic fields in the amount of $14,000. Um, and then as far as um, sidewalk repairs, so current concrete sidewalks that are failing on campus, we have about six, we have $60,000 budgeted and um, just to put this into perspective, we have about 57,000 square feet of concrete sidewalks on the, the campus. Um, in addition, on page 28 of the budget book, you can review the capital projects that did not get included in the administrative budget proposal. Thank you. Okay, and I think that was, yep. Yeah. Okay. Questions for Michael?
Michael, can you just um, mentioned, I know for the custodial supplies, you know, some of this as, as Mike mentioned in terms of the, um, the, the temp custodial staff and the additional supplies are again, we're, we're assuming that will be a full return, but um, with the need to still do some uh, mitigation efforts as far as um, reducing or preventing COVID spread. Um, and I know Mike, you've, you've experienced some significant increases in the particularly supplies. Can you give like, some examples of, of some of the increases we've seen over the course of the year? Oh yeah, so um, for instance, uh, a box of gloves. Um, I normally would pay prior to COVID was like, I got a price of $5.60 a box. I'm upwards of $24 a box for, for gloves. Yeah. Um, another, disinfectants have gone up by almost 25%. Um, the alcohol wipes that we use for the desktops and stuff for the students, depending on the vendor, four to six dollars a container. Um, hand sanitizer was was very high at one point. It's starting to come down in price. I'm I'm able to price shop on that. Um, but yeah, supply and demand has really affected um, the supply budget because of COVID. Yeah. Just a question, uh, maybe more for Scott. Um, wasn't there a meeting on the sewer uh, fees recently? Does that is that take into account what they talked about, or um, it must have had an easy year this year, being that you know a lot of people were working at home with their septic systems and not using the sewer systems. Um. I would I would like to I would like to think that that was the case, Finn, and it might have actually been <laughs> in reality the case. But the way that we're charged for sewer fees is not you know what comes in and what goes out. It's a um, it's it's kind of a occupancy that is based upon how many people you have, whether they happen to be in the building or not. Um, here's the good news. The good news. Is, so this does reflect that. It, it reflects the um the initial increase that we received um over the summer which you know the increased price um continues forward but we did meet with the um with the the water board and it was a very congenial meeting and they certainly understood um our concerns and their initial thinking was that they had um, they believe that they found that there was a different calculation that they should have been using, which would have cost us a substantial increase. We're talking thirty, forty thousand dollars, and they have for the next five years put that, put the kibosh on that, and so uh, we will not be seeing any other increase. So it was a very fruitful meeting in that, you know, we saved about thirty thousand a year for the next five years, and they were happy to do it for us. So. Awesome. Yeah, that's that was what I was looking for because I know they had that meeting and uh, appreciate the, the info. Yeah. And um, Hebron Elementary Schools joined us as well for that. So, um, yeah, a lot of people benefited from that. Okay, other questions? Uh, Scott, uh, this is Joe. Um, I guess this question is for Eva or because uh, it's more of a financial, but I've always been curious. I think I've asked this for the last seven years on the budget, how we know we have solar panels. We increased solar panels over the last few years. Um, we give money back to the grid. I understand the operational of how it works, but how can we can never get, I'd like to know what we pay in electricity and what we, what the benefit and so how you can quantify what the solar panels provide as a cost um, reduction to our current energy platform. So do we know that number? Is it shown? Cause you know, Mike has articulated that we've changed, signed up for another four years for energy. Um, but I never see in the budget how it would be nice to, to, to show that, that we have a savings from solar panels versus our, our, you know, mm -hmm. our energy footprint. 
So, Joe, just so I understand you correctly, so you're looking for what the cost of the electricity would be prior to the solar panels and then what it is with the solar panels. Yes, because uh, your our energy is coming, our primary energy is coming from Eversource, correct? Correct. And also, I mean, for electricity, uh, natural gas is natural gas. We know what that cost is. So what I, I would like to know, and I think the board should know this number, is what is the benefit of the solar panels and how is, what does that number reflect in our energy, our energy footprint? And, I, and I've asked that question over the many, many years. Somebody must know it. And I, that's why I said it was probably Eva's question, because, you know, when you're giving money back to the grid um, or you're getting, I'm sorry, you're giving energy back to the grid and you're getting an offset for that, um, is that number calculated in our, our line item for energy? So, Joe, to answer that question, we have a consultant that works with us that handles the calculations of this because it is really complicated. But yes, um, everything is captured in that electricity line. Um, as for the four year lease that Michael was speaking about, so because of deregulation of energy bills, we're allowed to shop around to see who gives us the best price for our supply in electricity. So we locked in um, with a new vendor that gave us a really good um, rate for the four years. Uh, it's still with Constellation Energy, but this new vendor that uh, helped negotiate the rate um, was a little more aggressive. So we were able to benefit from that. So all of that is taken into account, but I'm sure we can get something from the consultant and we can have um, Mr. Leslie share that with the board. Okay, since you brought up Constellation Energy, so is this a variable rate or is this is, is this a, uh, a locked in rate for four years? With it's a, lock, it's a locked in rate, but annually the rate, I believe, increases. And Michael can correct me if I'm wrong on that. I would have to pull the contract to verify that. But I can get back to you. Okay. Um, the other question I had, Mike, is... Um, or Scott, Leslie, um, how is the media, middle school? We did, we replaced the flooring in the uh, media center two years ago now. And um, I'd like to know how that, since I haven't seen it this year, how is it holding up? Mike, I'm gonna let you take that one. So you're, you're referencing the high school media center? The high school. High school media center, yes, sir. Gotcha, okay, okay. Uh, I, so it, it was chosen to put luxury vinyl planking in that that space. Um, there's, it's holding up relatively well, um, but there is some areas where there's some uh, scratching of from furniture or kids, you know, sliding objects across the floor that they shouldn't be and things of that nature. So the, there's some wear and tear that's starting to show on it, but. Um, Overall, it's still in, in very good condition and aesthetically looks good. Would we consider utilizing, uh, using this again for futuristic rooms or anything? Personally, I wouldn't recommend it as for a product for flooring in a school. Yeah, no, I, I would concur. Okay. That's it for me for now. Okay. Other questions on facilities? Okay. Well, you know this this is this this is kind of a first for us because in looking back over previous um, budget workshops, I saw that um, the board had never enjoyed a formal presentation on athletics. So. Um, I've asked Dan Trudeau to join us and walk us through athletic programming for the 21-22 school year. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dan Trudeau. I'm the athletic director. Um, I am working off my phone right now just because my internet's a little choppy at my house, so um, I apologize if... if uh, something's not coming in clear um but yeah just to um you know give 
you know, give an overview of kind of where I, I want the philosophy of the program to be and, and, um, you know, how the budget shapes that is we're, we're ultimately looking to provide our students both at the middle and high school, um, as well as the, the parent community, um, and the greater community, um, with an athletic experience that's, that's going to serve as a tool, um, you know, to, um, further enhance the, our, our educational, um, system. Um, you know, I think it was, I think it was said earlier that, um, you know, we want, we want our kids to become productive adults in the community. Um, and I think athletics is, is, you know, one of the most foundational tools a school has, has to do that. Um, so certainly, um, that's, that's what all the items in my, in my budget are, um, you know, I, I like to look at that as that's what it's, what it's going to, um, as far as, strategies and goals um really looking to provide our students coaches and families with a resource education and assistance to um you know gain that pursuit of college athletics opportunities um i put that in there because that's that's really something in my you know year and a half at ram um that has has sort of been um asked of me um by the greater community just to um, to help out with, um, and I and I think that you know there's certain technologies out there that are being used for um, other coaching tools and coaching purposes um, that we can add into to what we do and and what I do um, within the program. Um, you know, furthermore, probably the most important is to provide our coaches with the necessary resources um, to maintain and implement high standards for our programs. Um, as well as kind of keeping a modern touch on coaching um, as, you know, um, we all know, I, I think, you know, high school age athletes are, are far more athletic than, uh, than they were, you know, 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and, and with that has to come, you know, more modern coaching. Um, so, again, continue to provide my coaches – um, and the staff with the tools to tools, resources, um, to do that. Um, you know, certainly, um, I'm big on, on the optics and, and uniforms and, and what you wear is, is something that kids are going to be proud of. And it's, it's gonna, it's gonna create a certain pride in your program. It's going to make more students hopefully want to be a part of the program. Um, so, you know, as we've talked about before, I've established a uniform cycle, um, you know, replacing uniforms on, on about a varsity uniforms on about a four year basis, allowing our varsity uniforms to stay um, in good condition through, you know, any any students high school career cycle um, and then allowing those varsity uniforms to be turned over to JV uniforms for probably another four years, which um, is just about the life cycle you should be able to get out of quality uniforms. Um, you know, another, uh, big objective with, with a lot of what, uh, um, we're doing is working to align the middle school and high school programs with one another. Um, you know, there's not a huge, uh, you know, budget, uh, aspect to that, but, um, it certainly plays into the strategies and goals of the program. Um, and then one, uh, kind of last major area, um, that I, that I think, um, you know, our budget is, is sort of, uh, focusing on is providing our students who, um, who compete in our co-op. So that would be boys hockey, uh, girls ice hockey and swim and dive with, with really a more complete experience at, as an athletic and, and team experience. Um, you know, co-ops are pretty, pretty unique. Um, you know, while most schools are, are part of them they're um they're a different experience and, and they're a little it's a little more challenging to create a true team atmosphere um in some of those co-ops so so certainly um some of the things we're doing um and some of the things that have that have been put into this budget such as transportation for co-ops um are uh, are are aligning towards that um with all that said um you know, this, this budget is, 
is is not that much different from what I submitted last year, and I wouldn't anticipate it being that much different from what gets submitted next year and the year after. Um, you know, I, I think the athletic budget is is going to remain pretty steady. You know, obviously some some increases and some decreases on an annual basis, but um, for the most part. You know, your supplies are, are your annual consumable team needs. That's, you know, balls for each team that they go through. Um, you know, uh, some teams go through, some teams have different, um, you know, other other miscellaneous categories like football. We have to get things reconditioned on a yearly basis. But it's essentially going to be the same cost almost every year. Um, uniform replacements and Again, with that four-year cycle, just trying to keep a, a relatively consistent um, cost and number in mind for those annual uniform replacements. Um, and then, you know, usually, you know, major pieces of equipment um, are, you know, every year you're probably going to have at, at least one that, that may need to be uh, repaired or replaced, um, you know, this year. Um, we need to replace a, a five-man football sled. So that's, you know, that's a, a significant um, cost and, and supplies. Um, but then we also have our annual dues and fees to the CIC, the CCC, uh, co-op fees, which we, which we pay to other schools for facility use, um, our Blackledge golf course rental for our golf team, um, and then certainly officials costs, um, which, which rack things up. Um, and then, you know, in, in kind of a miscellaneous category, uh, our transportation is obviously going to be a pretty big number every year. Our athletic training services contract with select physical therapy um, and some software services um, such as family ID, um, which I believe actually comes out of Scott's budget. So I'm, I'm probably cheating by saying that. Um, but Huddle, which is a, a coaching tool um, that, you know, allows us to film um, pretty much every game. Um, it allows coaches to keep a database of the film. Um, it allows students to, to use it as a tool um, for their own recruiting as well as their own, you know, kind of learning of the game. Um, as that's become really more of a departmental tool this year, um, we're still learning some of the ins and outs of it. Um, but then also our, our impact concussion software. Um, so again, that's, um, just kind of a, an overview of, of next year's budget. But I think um, annually that's, that's pretty, it, it's pretty on par with what it's going to be. And, and as long as the concepts stay the same um, outside of wanting to add a program or two down the road to increase opportunities, I, I don't see, um, you know, significant increases anywhere. So questions? No, but this is Judy, and I appreciate that um, overview. It clearly has been lacking in past years, so thank you. Just a non-budgetary non question. Uh, are we anticipating getting any parents into winter games this, this season, or is that tabled for the whole season? I mean, I, I think it's I think it's a fair question or a fair uh, sentiment to say that we'll 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 reevaluate it. Um, you know, obviously, we all know the numbers in the state are going down, and um, you know, but we're also being told to to be wary of, of March and what could happen. Um, you know, I think in the conversations I've had with um, Penny and and Scott, I think we're all certainly open to that reevaluation of the decision, um, you know, in a, in a, in a few weeks or so, but, you know, I, I don't want to make any promises or, you know, shut anything down completely. So. Um, Dan, thank you for the, um, for the sports. This is Kathleen. I'm sorry. No um, uh, the stuff that the, the students can watch, they can log in like the basketball game is on right now. You have to pay to watch that. Uh, so it's, it's, I mean, it's not funny you bring that up. I've actually been on my, on my phone texting a bunch of people and sending emails. Um, 
so our boys team is at East Catholic right now, and they're having issues with their streaming service. Um, for away games, a lot of the parents are going to have to pay um, because that's what the other schools are offering. For us, I'm doing it on our Ram Athletics Facebook page, so it's actually free. Um, and I, I don't believe you need to have an actual Facebook account to actually um, watch it. I think you can just go to the page. But, but what Ram is offering for our home games is free. Um, but I can't – we can't control, um, you know, what, uh, what uh, platforms other schools are using. So – yeah, sure. That's the, I understand that. It's just disappointing. Um, my phone is next to me so I can see when my boys use my credit card. <laughs> All of a sudden, what are they paying $4.99 for to watch a local basketball game? <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, in all honesty, I, I, I didn't see it as a necessary cost. Um, you know, a lot of the schools that have the subscription fee, they paid – upwards of $5,000 to have a camera installed in their facilities. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then on top of that, they're asking their families to, to pay a subscription fee. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I saw Facebook live as, as, you know, an, uh, you know, kind of an, I guess, out of the box option for live streaming sports. But, um, you know, I, I'd rather have more people have access to it. Um, I appreciate so, so that. not Thanks. have it be cost restrictive, you know. Well, uh, yeah, it's so. too bad. I wish everybody had that. Um, and go Ram, but you don't want to know the score right now. <laughs> East Catholic is pretty good. Dan, this is Joe. Uh, my question on the on the uniform rotation is: Is this typical eight years? Um, I know it's not typical for Ram because Ram has been a lot further than, uh, you know, I mean, greater than eight years in previous years, as probably Scott can attest to, but is that something I question that eight years, four years in varsity and you four years down to JV. Um, what about our freshman uniforms? If, if we have freshman sports, I mean, the, obviously these last two years have been um, probably non-existent, but is that typical four years for, um, for, for, um, for varsity and then they pass them down to JV or we're not buying JV uniforms at the, at the same because varsity uniforms are, are obviously for as, as, as a student matures, I mean, they're, they're bigger, right. Than, than JV. Um, no. Yeah. I mean, the size thing is, I, I get where you're coming from on that. I I've never had that come up as an issue. Um, you know, so I, I think recycling the varsity uniforms down to JV is the most practical way to get, you know, really the maximum use out of, out of a uniform. Um, you know, I, it, it, that is the, the most typical practice that you would recycle your varsity uniforms down. Um, you know, I, I do know there's some districts, like I know, um, for instance, I know Darien Public Schools, their uniform replacement cycle is, is three years. Um, but I, I know there's other schools that are, you know, up to five years. There's schools that don't have a uniform replacement cycle and just kind of, uh, you know, they go as long as they possibly can. And then when it's time, it's time. Um, you know, I look at four years as a, as a fair number um, because I, I think – that no student would ever go four years without having a new uniform if they were a four-year varsity athlete. Um, just because if you come in as a freshman and your team gets new uniforms, you know you're you're getting that uniform. Um, so, and and it, and it you know four years is you know it it, it keeps uniforms in, in time with the styles. Um, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, Dan, but my, my I guess my direct question is maybe I misheard you. You're, it's four years for a varsity uniform, and it's four years for a JV uniform, right? Because, like I said, there's size differential. I and I, I think you said we're 
four years is going to be varsity, then you're going to pass those down, down to JV. I, I yeah. really sincerely hope we're not doing that. I mean, that is, that is the plan that we're, we're, we're on so that you're getting a, an eight year lifespan out of the uniforms. So that, I mean, that is what, that is what we're doing. Um, and it's, you know, I, I'm not sure what the timeline of, of, you know, previous replacement of uniforms was, but, you know, we're certainly using, you know, our old varsity uniforms for JV now. Um, and, and were last year, but is, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it sport really, uh, dependent? Uh, I I'm, I'm going to give you my, 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 my experience with my children. Um, when, when they, they got the pass downs, they were, you know, my kids weren't, were not big, you know, big and broad, you know what I mean? And then you had this uniform and, uh, that's all baggy on these children. And we look like, you know, we don't look respectable. So I, I'm concerned with that. Um, number one, uh, that, you know, you have these uniforms that don't, that aren't appropriate to, for younger kids that are not, you know, the same size. So uh, I, I, I think that's a little bit asking, you know, again, I, I've experienced this and I, I know my, my, my cousin, I mean, my uh, nephews are in the same thing, you know, when they're playing uh, um, baseball, the uniforms have been, you know, a lot bigger on, on some of these kids. And I think that's uh, um, stigmatism. So I, I would hope you consider that if that is the rotation uh, that, you know, we're not going to dress children uh, with larger uniforms than, than their frames. I wouldn't want that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree with you and I, I, I see where you're coming from. Um, I, I'll say this. I now granted, I've only been through a fall and winter season um, at Ram and granted my second fall season was different than anything else um i i did not notice it at all last year that that we had students wearing you know particularly our sub varsity students that we had them wearing uh uniforms that didn't fit properly um you, you know and with that said i i don't disagree with that um sentiment that we wouldn't want them going out there and looking poor i'm probably the you know, I, I want our kids to look good in their uniforms, um, you know, I, and my my kind of honest response is I would love to start, you know, I would love to spend more money on uniforms um, and and and, you know, include more money for uniforms annually. Hi, in, this is Gene. Can I so. can I ask a question? Um, in this rather lengthy conversation about uniforms. First of all, can anyone answer how long we've been doing this practice at Ram? Is this like a new practice, or have we been doing this all along? Um, and and the second, I, I don't think we should be, you know, looking at schools like Darien. That's an extremely wealthy community. We're not going to go there. Not not people don't want to pay taxes for that here. Yeah, I. I put together a calendar last year um just so i could i could call up that calendar and i could tell you you know the next 10 years of of what year the volleyball team is going to get new new uniforms um and again you know darian is there they do it every three years um you know i i again i put it up to to four years um and 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 i wasn't trying to use darian as as the example, I was just trying to say that, yes, other schools, you know, general generally would go on a three to five year cycle. So, you know, I, I put us in the, in the middle and, of the road. And do other schools then hand them down? Yes. Okay. So it's a fairly common practice. Thank you. Just to go off what Joe was saying, though, um, how does that work with the middle school? Because we're talking about the high school, but um, I, I brought this up before where uh, my boys are playing middle school sports and it's, I, did they get passed down from the high school to the middle school? Cause we had kids with duct tape numbers. And I do remember seeing kids with oversized shirts that they couldn't even tuck into their baseball pants. Um, so do those uniforms get transitioned from the high school to the middle school? And maybe that's the issue. Maybe we don't understand the middle school so much. Um, I, 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 I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't believe they did. Um, cause I believe the middle school and high school was, 
was pretty separate from each other. Um, so maybe it just needs to be taken a look at at the middle school then. Yeah. And, and I mean, the middle school is, you know, there's a similar, you know, kind of a similar rotation. I don't have it as, as well laid out as I do for the high school. Um, but another, you know, to, to take something that you said, you talked about the numbers peeling off and using duct tape, no, duct tape numbers. Um, you know, one thing that's one uniform style that's become really, you know, the go-to style to use for, for high schools are the sublimated uniforms where the numbers are, they're embedded into the ink of the Jersey rather. We're not doing screen printing anymore. Um, and those uniforms actually hold up way better. The, you know, the quality holds up a little better. Um, as far as, you know, sizing a middle school student athlete and trying to predict out, I think it's, it's a little more unpredictable than, than, high school is um you know it's i think it's a little more common to get you know that oversized eighth grader like i was in eighth grade and you know versus you know being able to predict like you know at the high school level you're gonna have a need to have a double xl uniform um you know so so i just think conceptually i'm gonna have to do a a, a, a pretty decent job of you know, measuring our middle school students and, and trying to take a good estimate of what's the appropriate amount of extra uniforms at a certain size I should buy to, to really try to prevent any of those kids going out onto a field with a, you know, an extremely baggy Jersey on. I think that's the, that's the real, that's the, that's the, uh, how you address that situation. I think if, you know, if we're ordering uniforms and, you know, again, history of this of Ram has been um, not good because um, I've lived it, and I and I don't mean to mean this lengthy conversation, but you know, it's something that you you need to look at um, whether it's four years or three years. All I'm suggesting is that that if you're looking at varsity uniforms and you're only getting a say, let's say use basketball and you're only getting a set of twenty, uh, maybe we should be looking at a set of twenty five versus twenty that you can filter those down that that to, to articulate what you said is the size because hebron in the past we're not very big uh i don't have big athletes out here so unfortunately they i think we need to look at that and i think that would cure the problem of having you know um the uh how we you know we our students look on a court you know when you have a um, smaller individual female or or male that the uniforms don't look right. You know, um, that's all I was trying to say. Four years, I can live with the four years, but it's, um, you know, they, they, we need to make sure that they, that when we budget or when you budget, that we're doing that accordingly and correctly, that we're, we're looking at those, those students and, uh, and maybe there's other best practices, Dan, you can, we can talk sidebar on that. So, uh, mm -hmm. thank you. No problem. Great. Any other questions for athletics? Great. Well, thank you, Dan. So um, what I'd like to do is, is kind of move in and, and talk about some of the information I shared in terms of the budget adjustments since the um, original budget book that everybody received. We made some um, adjustments and I, I shared these individual sheets with the board. So I will go through and Okay. So what I'd like to do is look at um, Since we first presented the board the budget and where we are today as you've heard in some of the um, discussions, there have been some. Um, oops, there have been some modifications, and things have changed a little bit. So, what I'd like to do is run through some of those changes just to bring everybody up to speed on where we are and, and why those changes occurred. Can everyone still see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so. Um, Let's look at 
at some of the, um, since we originally presented the budget and as, as I hope you, you, you've seen at this point, we do have, um, this is a fairly fluid process still and from presenting the first budget um, in January to where we are now, there have been some changes. Fortunately, the vast majority of those changes um, have been to the um, to our benefit and have resulted in a much lower budget request. Um, but there have been some um, a, adjustments that have that have required us to adjust up in some cases. So, what I have on the, my screen are the adjustments that we've added which are adding money to the budget so for example we have a an additional field trip we have some additional gym inspections that um, we added to this budget um, we have some um, six assignments which will allow us to cover um, some of the art classes in the middle school We've got some other six assignments. So there's, and here it's only $326, but for the um, art classes in the middle school, it's 25,000. This isn't a new practice. This is just something that um, we needed to add to make sure that it was reflected in the budget. Um, and then we had um, really because of enrollment changes in our health plan, we have a series of um, increases that um, impacted the budget in terms of people choosing a different um, benefit level um, or changing their benefit level. So we had a number of enrollment changes. And as you can see, we're, um, they're specific to the departments. And so we have a number of changes that are specific to the departments in terms of healthcare costs. And then similarly, we have a number of changes which are related specifically to the, um, the health insurance, the, um, the high yield health um, program. So those are the changes that um, aren't budgeted, but just simply due to employee movement. And those totals add an additional 179 thousand six hundred and three dollars to the budget those reflect the increases since we first presented the budget we also have some fairly significant decreases some of these we talked about um, earlier this evening in terms of some of the changes in our um, special ed programming um, we received a benefit in that our workers' comp insurance decreased by 5%, will, will decrease by 5% this year. Um, we have a number of adjustments in terms of um, placement of students, not only tuition placements, but um, reductions in travel. So you can see that um, we have a reduction of 488,000, um, 107,000. These are related to um, student movements. Some of these are the age 22 adjustments that um, Christine mentioned earlier this evening. Um, so as you can see, that had a, a pretty profound impact by making that change from um, the end of the year in which the student turns 22 and budgeting through their 22nd birthday. Um, we have a number of summer school um, placements that are reducing our travel expenses. We have a, um, for, for this year's Woods programming, we're going to continue with Woods programming at the level that it is currently at. Um, we had budgeted a 0.6 Woods teacher. Um, because we're in a have been in a hybrid model most of the year. We really don't have the students that are going to be um, transitioning up into and filling a full Woods program. So we're gonna keep it where it is now using six assignments. So we we'll are remove that from the budget. Um, we have a number of CTE programs, well, one CTE program in particular that is not running next year. That's our video production program. The um, teacher who has 
historically taught video production has transitioned into our CERT and EMT training program, which has just absolutely exploded in interest um, and student enrollment. So um, we've been able to reduce some of the cost that would have been related to video production. As you can see, they're, they're, they're fairly minor in the scheme of things. Um, because we are not running the full woods program, we're able to reduce some supplies. We have some um, software costs that we're able to save one by not running the, um, the video production program and the other by covering some of the costs that we will need to um, purchase through grants. We have, um, and then there's some additional health changes. Most of these are due to the fact that when we originally budgeted, we were, um, our health consortium agreed to a 5.5% increase. Um, once we, um, actually after we had presented or, or prepared the initial budget, um, the health consortium agreed on a 3.2% increase. And so you'll see enrollment changes for health insurance. And again, those are associated with the departments that those individuals are in. And you'll see there are quite a few of those. And again, those represent the lower um, percentage increase for health insurance. So that our total deductions or reductions are $886,386. You add all of that together, and what it has allowed us to do is when we look at the proposed um, operating budget in comparison to our current operating budget, and you consider in the um, anticipated revenue, that brings the um, operating budget proposal to 2.4%. Our capital budget remains unchanged from the initial proposal. Um, that still is a reduction of 12.78% compared to what we're, um, what we've budgeted for this year. And that leads to a total um, percentage of operating and capital, bu of capital budget of a net increase of 2.26%. And that is compared to our original um, request, which were in the which was in the four percent range. It was it was four point zero six percent. So those those are the the change. Let me stop there, and I'll be happy to answer any questions regarding those figures. And then I'd like to talk uh, just a little bit about the um, some of the additional state COVID funding. Scott, yep. if I could just add to what you were stating on um, on the revenues because of the age twenty two configuration and reductions, we also had to uh, recalculate excess costs. So your revenue shows a new dollar amount. That's a reduced dollar amount for excess costs from what was originally proposed in the first budget book. Thank you. So any, any questions on any of the budget adjustments? Okay, let me, sorry, let me, let me go through the ESSER funds. This will just take a, a minute, but I think this is important to, um, understand some of the additional funding available to us and um, some of our recommendations for using this. So the emergency, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund, these are, these are federal funds which um, go through the state. And what the state has done with our 
um, the ESSER, ESSER II entitlement, which we were just notified of last week, is these are based upon our Title I um, grant money. So they, they used a calculation so that every district received an amount of money. The amount that Region 8 is receiving is $126,981. And this is based upon our, our Title IX, our Title IX um, entitlement. These are funds that are not meant to supplant what we might normally budget, but these are um, to supplement and provide additional resources that will allow us to address some of the challenges that we've experienced due to um, due to COVID. And this is a well, this is um, this budget is designed to um, take us through, in particular, through this summer and through next school year. There are state level priorities. So what the state is, is they, they maintain 10% of all of the monies that before they get distributed um, to the towns. And so they're using that funding to focus on academic supports, learning loss, learning acceleration and recovery. Um, certainly throughout the state, throughout the country, um, there has been a real challenge of learning loss due to the myriad types of, of learning programs that have been enacted this year. Um, focusing money on family and community connections. Um, this is to help support families, um, support their own children, um, whether they be remote or hybrid or through any um, other type of um, modified instructional practice. Focusing on school safety and social emotional well being, not only of our students, but of our school staff, and to ensure that districts are able to um, bridge the digital divide and make sure that their students are able to engage in remote learning and that staff are trained and have the resources and skills necessary to do so. The types of things that we are able to use these ESSER funds for, um, I think the first bullet really addresses what is, is I think the overarching um, focus of these funds and that's addressing learning loss amongst our, amongst our students. Looking at activities to address unique needs of low income children, um, children with disabilities, English learners, minority students, students experiencing homeless. So this, this is a, um, you know, also a pool of money that we can use to support those students who are most disadvantaged. Training prof um, and professional development for staff on sanitation and minimizing the spread of infectious diseases. And to go along with that, purchasing supplies to sanitize and clean facilities. Um, and then, if necessary, planning for and coordinating activities during any long-term closures. So these are the types of things that the money is earmarked for, although I would um, suggest that really based upon the state areas of target, it's the first two bullets that they're, um, they're most concerned with. Um, Purchasing ed additional uses, purchasing educational technology, another of the, the state focus areas, providing mental health services and supports, planning and implementing activities related to summer learning. Um, I've starred these, these last two only because they're, they're new to the ESSER fundings. The original ESSER funding one did not include these. And this would include facility repairs and improvements that would allow a district to reduce the risk of transmission within a building um, and in inspecting and testing maintenance, repair and replacement um, to upgrade indoor air quality. Um, we're very fortunate in that this has not been a um, serious challenge for Region 8, although certainly districts around the state have um, experienced um, lots of issues with indoor air quality and um, their facilities, particularly those districts that have old um, buildings and have, have not maintained um, or adequately maintained their buildings. 
So when we received the monies, um, I brought the administration together and our, and our teacher leaders and asked the question, you know, what, what, what would we, what would be in the best interest of our students in using these funds to address those issues of um, learning loss and, um, and mental health services. So in our initial planning, and I'm, I'm, I'm calling this initial planning because we still have not received the application for these funds. Um, although we have been allocated the almost $127,000, we still need to complete an application process to actually receive all the money. And we have to demonstrate that we have a plan that fits within their parameters and that we have a plan to, to spend the money. Um, in our initial planning for RAM, um, for both the middle and the high school, some of the programs that we would be interested in looking at would be summer school programming. We typically don't offer summer school programming. We offered some online summer school programming last year and found that to be um, less than um, what we were hoping it to be. And so when we talk about summer school pro programming, this would be to actually hire teachers to come in and work um, with, with students on either more one-to-one -one or in small group settings so that a student who may have had difficulty working through this year will have that personal connection and, and hopefully a better chance of success um, in doing credit recovery over the summer as opposed to simply working in an online um, format, which might have been part of their problem all along. Um, assessments to measure student progress. Um, we are looking um, to make sure that we understand where our students are so that we can tailor our programs to address specific learning losses. And in particular, we'd be looking at reading and math. Um, additional instructional time for advanced placement courses. One of the, one of the benefits that I think a lot of our teachers across the country have have been able to take advantage of is that as instruction becomes interrupted, they're able to focus on those skills that are are most germane to what it is that the, the course covers and that are most important for students to walk away from the course with. So there's been, significant modifications with, with curriculum and um, the breadth of curriculum. That's not necessarily true for advanced placement courses. The College Board has not reduced the amount of material that students are expected to um, cover in the advanced placement courses. So um, we're looking at the possibility of, of adding some additional money um, that would allow us to allow our teachers to provide additional um, instructional time. Um, for students in advanced placement co um, courses. Next year, at the middle school in particular, um, a recommendation to possibly add some additional academic labs to each team. Um, these would be more small group, one-to-one -one, um, supports for students. They don't take the place of a course. They really are a um, support mechanism that would be available for, for those students that, that need it most. Um, they wouldn't necessarily be special needs students. They could be any of our students who are just maybe struggling in an area um, due to um, some concepts that they may, may not have fully grasped during this year. Um, and possibly looking at some additional time for student mental health services, whether it be a um, part-time social worker, counselor, um, but provide some additional services for our students as we transition back into our um a normal school year next year these are just some of our initial thoughts and i wanted to share that just to show you kind of the the area that we're thinking of for this for this money um as i said we still have a ways to go for this the portal will be open in february early march we'll need to do a needs assessment why are we asking for these things what's the evidence to show that these are our challenges for our district um, program narratives to describe the programs, and then specific um, funding requests. 
And um, so I think one of the reasons for my um, kind of thorough review of that is that, so we do have this pool of $127,000. Um, I think an easy use of the money would be to say, well, let's use that to cover some of the extra mitigation money that that Michael described earlier this evening, um, or some of um, cover some of the um, the custodial fees that we believe um, will be important to budget for. Um, I'm hoping that we can use this funds not not to uh, mitigate the budget increase, but instead to really focus on those types of instructional um, activities um, and areas of focus that I just described. So, you know, it, it really gives districts a choice here. We can use that money to um, address some of the additional funding. Um, that we've included in our budget for um, COVID issues, or um, you know, we can use it to continue to explore the needs of our students and some of the additional programming that is not in the proposed budget, but that we feel is maybe critical um, as our students um, finish out this year and transition into a, a normal year next year. Um, so, and I'm, I'm hopeful that a uh, with the budget coming in at this point at, at 2.2%, we'd, we'd be able to have that flexibility. So I'll, I'll open it to questions. This is Jean, not a question, just I'm very glad to see that the focus was on students and on, on student learning for the funds. That's good, good. I think we need it. Scott, this is Stephanie. Um, the portals open in February, March. Is there any idea um, how long it will take to actually get the funds and if there may be a problem implementing some of these with, with um, you know, the timeline that we actually receive them? Um, or do you think we'll receive them in time to... Well, uh, the... Um and I, I think Eva can can probably comment on her prediction of the timeline. I, I can tell you that in the in the in the information that they've provided us, you know, they they kind of talk about the emphasis being summer and next year. So I I don't anticipate that this is money that's going to be readily available for us right now, this year. Um, we may get lucky and there may be, you know, some of it may be available for, for the spring, but I think the vast majority of it, if not all of it, is really going to be for the summer and, and moving forward. So on our phone call, it was stated that the um, needs assessment was still being developed by the State Department of Education. And the other complicating factor of this is, is that OPM is in charge of these funds. So OPM requires a lot I guess, more stringent um, factors or, or um, checks and balances to ensure that we're spending the money with the way that the federal government has um, so written the way that the money is supposed to be spent. Um, Eva, so having stated that it's supposed to be open on February 22nd or the week of February 22nd, but seeing how we waited, I believe, a good month before they even told us that much information from when they when we originally expected, I, I don't hold my breath for February 22nd. Eva, what was the first thing you said? Do you, do you recall? Um, the fact that the needs assessment is still being developed by the State Department of Education. So the needs, so part of the grant application process, so even though we've been allocated this $127,000, the grant, we have to apply for the grant. As part of the grant application process, there's a needs assessment that needs to be completed by the district. Um, and that basically tells them um, that we really do need what we're asking for in, and we'll utilize it in the way that we are thinking that we want to. And if they see that the needs are greater than what yep. the money is allocated. The state has extra funding that the state's allowed to utilize and the state can then add that money or that kind of programmatic to their kind of funding. Okay. And I, I agree with Jean. I liked the focus. 
It, it, you know, and, and I and I think you know, and I th I think Eva, what what you've just described is really kind of also important to understand that um, if a district wanted to use this money, say to mitigate any budget increase going ahead to next year, it that might be a difficult task. Only in the timeline may not necessarily line up with um, our budget process in that um, we don't know how long it's going to take to get the needs assessment done and, and to move through the process. So we may or may not even, you know, really understand what it is that we're going to be able to use it for um, until the budget process is probably almost done. Any other uh, questions? Scott, this is Joe. So if I understand this correctly, then we, we shouldn't even be talking about this any further than in this budget cycle, then, correct? That would be my recommendation, Joe, yes. I, now, I'm going to, having said that, I'll, I'll just to add to the, to the potential confusion with additional funding coming in, um, it's likely that any stimulus package that's passed um, in Congress will have money for school districts. That is a an entire mystery at this point. I, I wouldn't even pretend to predict what that might be usable for or what that might do for us. Um, but I would agree, Joe, that I think this funding is is, you know, I would prefer that we not talk, we not use it as part of this process so that we can um, you know, take full advantage of it to support our students. Not that the budget doesn't do that, but um, you know, having Considering where we are now and the needs of our um, students and community, I think that it it has better purposes other than you know being considered as part of the budget. Well, thanks for being honest with that. I also think that we could you know we could develop a game plan uh, to utilize that this money as a as a capital need futuristically. That this a lot of this stuff falls into their spectrum of capital doesn't it capital improvement um not if we use it for um like student learning pieces so if we're providing extra support for students with academic labs or extra support for ap students um extra support for summer school those sorts of things those wouldn't a district could use it for a capital piece if they needed to say um you know upgrade an air handling unit or something along those lines. You know, some some of the um, more disadvantaged districts are getting amounts, you know, in the multiple millions. And so for them, it might be a more realistic use of that money to say, we're going to upgrade our air handling units so that um, we have healthier air within the building, climate in the building. But I think for RAM, Probably, I, I, I don't think that this would be a capital item. I think this would really be more used for program um, and instructional. But it's not, all right, so the money, it's not really, there's no restriction to offset our budget for this money from the state, right? This is state money or is this federal money? It's federal, federal money. It's federal money that, that comes through, through the state. Um, we cannot use it to um, supplant anything that's already in our budget. So you can't say, well, we, we we typically budget for this, and we'd like to use this grant money to cover those costs. We we can only use it to supplement and do something that we wouldn't typically do, um, and and it's doing something that we wouldn't typically do with with some relationship to addressing COVID. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Thanks. Okay. Are there any other questions for Scott? Stephanie, are we going to open up for, because this is a budget workshop, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Okay. So we're, we're, we have opportunity here to ask other questions other than related to, or are we only sticking to the agenda? Well, it is a budget workshop. Um, Scott? Are we, do you think we need to open it up for other other budget questions, right, Joe? That's what I would like to do. I mean, yeah. since we're, yeah. uh, I mean, it is a budget workshop, so I, 
my interpretation of why we're here, right? Besides yes. Scott right. delivering on the agenda items of the three, you know, technology, athletics, and facilities. Absolutely. Yep. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, I, that was my question. I just want to ask, you know, yeah. maybe there's other board members that have other questions, but. Um, yep. Well, we'd be happy to answer, entertain any questions. And obviously we don't have the answer right away. We'll certainly get them for you. Right, right now, just looking forward, we have um, at the regular Board of Ed meeting on the 22nd, we have essentially, we'll also schedule a budget workshop session. Um, we will have the coordinators will attend that meeting. I will provide you with their presentations beforehand so they will not be presenting their presentations, which I know they've done in the past. Um, to do so would take up easily the entire night and then some. Um, so we're hoping that this will also, kind of like Joe suggests here, provide you know, opportunities for additional questions. Um, so we'll have the February 22nd with the department coordinators available to answer questions. And then on March 1st, we have a public budget forum um, where um, a, members of the public will be invited to um, ask any questions regarding the budget as well. So I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions or entertain any questions. And if I can't answer it now, we'll certainly come back with the answers related to the budget. Does anyone have any questions? And don't forget, you can always email Scott Absolutely. Um, with questions uh, if, if any um, pop up before the next meeting. So. Hi, this is Jean. I, I just want to say it seems it feels a bit of a moving target right now. So it, 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 it's hard to have questions of something that's changing pretty quickly. Um, and, and yes, you're, you're certainly correct, Jean. I think right now it, it's, it's pretty settled in. I think that, uh, you know, we're not going to be seeing these, you know, I, I wish I could tell you that you know, I've got another savings of 400,000 next week. Um, but no, we're we're past that, so it, it's it's pretty settled in. Any any changes at this point are are going to be fairly uh, minor. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, if there are no any, um, no other questions, we'll move on to um... Stephanie. I, I I was waiting. Uh, I do have. Oh, a couple sorry, of Joe. So, Go ahead, Joe. Um, since nobody else has any, um, I'd like to look at um, uh, since the budget, if we were to increase capital. Um, I've reflected on some of the, um, and I've shared this with some other board members, um, you know, we continue to move in a, in a negative direction with capital to um, kind of squeeze whole, squeeze us into a, a number for, that's approved or palatable for the, for the taxpayers. Um, so I, I'd like to see if, you know, for the next uh, budget, what it would, what the budget would look like with us getting to either 450,000 or $500,000 in capital. So that would be my starting point. Um, since it is a moving target, um, we've, we, you know, last year we were at 343. We've now we're down to 299. Year before that, we we're uh, up higher than that. You know, um, we have some significant, um, major items that are coming our way. Um, and, I, and I think we still need to start thinking uh, about how uh, we, we budget uh, appropriately for, for capital. We're doing it with, uh, with IT, which I think is proven to be a, a valuable asset and how we're, how we're budgeting for IT each year. We're also doing it with health insurance for the consortium. Um, um, a question for Mike Schlehofer would be, I'd like to know what the number is for when the roof is going to become due, and I think it's coming due in five or six years. What is that going that cost? It's not in your, it's not in the calculated uh, capital for uh, on page 27, 28 for the next uh, uh, items that we have. So uh, I'm very concerned about where we're going to be, and I know we have a debt consolidation, but we we need to start thinking as a board where we're going to be and how what our master plan is going to be to. You know, um, we're talking about kitchen equipment that's uh, going to be replaced. Um, 
and um, I think we're going to be having some challenging years coming forward. So I think we need to re reevaluate capital um, and how those numbers are going to look at since we're we're in the budget process. So that would be my uh, my my suggestions, and I'd like to have some other conversations with you, Scott, uh, and 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 Stephanie, if you'd like. But um, in the facilities, I I don't think we've um, you know, we came in at 299, but I think that's because of some of the recommendations that have come in um, without looking futuristically on, on some of the big, big items that are coming due. So I'd like to think we should look, we should re rethink that. So, so go ahead. Just, just so I understand. So what you'd like us to do is to um, take this budget proposal and, and bring in next year, what would it look like if capital rather than coming in at 299 came in at either 450 or 500, just to get an idea of what does that mean as far as the overall increase? Correct. Gotcha. Okay. And, and specific um, figures for the roof repair? Correct. Yep. yep. And, and I also just want to plant a seed for, for the board members, you know, you know, we, um, for some of the board members who weren't here before, we, we've we been doing, you know, we would always sacrifice to get to a number. So we would take whatever we the facility director recommended in capital, we would, and then we'd try to get to a 3% or a 2.5%, and then we would just continue to prolong capital. And that's not a good way to budget. And then since we bifurcated the budget, I think we have support for capital in our three towns, which, uh, clearly over the last three years have, have supported that. Um, so I think we, we know we have an aging building and I just want to mention this, that we, we we're going to continue to have things that are going to fail and uh, we should start thinking along those lines, how we really want to budget and do we really want to, you know, maybe say we budget 450, 500 every year going forward um, in our capital budget in order to, you know, we have the mechanism with the capital non reoccurring that you can roll these numbers, you can roll those things back into that, that capital number. Um, and then it's hopefully it's a way of saving to when we get to the five or six or seven year mark, whatever, we're going to have to replace the roof or something else that we, we have money and then we don't have to go and bond it. Um, it's just another way of thinking. That's all. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. So I think that, um, you know, is certain worthy of exploring and I was pleased that you had a report this evening on sports additionally to kind of piggyback on Jean I want to see academics really supported and then and you know perhaps you feel like that's being done and perhaps it is but I would like to see that um, even to a greater extent uh, what are we imagining for mathematics, for coding, for world language? Because, um, you know, I, I agree that a healthy sports program is really incredibly important. And I think I shared when I worked on the other side of the state, the pride from some of the buildings over there was um, something. It is beautiful. And I would love that level of upkeep on our on our facilities, but um, as as important, certainly we are a learning organization. I really want to know what we're doing for, as you said, supporting our AP kids, our world languages, our science, um, you know, technology, mathematics. Yep. So I guess I guess as you have been trying to do, is yes, aligning with our strategic plan but also to be kind of furthering that along because not that it's getting old, but it, you know, the world is, a, is pretty much changed with the pandemic since the strategic plan as far as academics and certainly delivery of academics and instruction. Yep. And, and Judy, I think a lot of like your questions are going to be really pertinent on the 22nd with the coordinators because they certainly are, you know, our academic champions. And I think, I, I, I know they are, and I want to keep that. And um, Joe, as always, you have a great idea. So I'm kind of uh, piggybacking on you and um, building off of that. It's good, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, you got to keep, you got to, you know, you, you always reel it back in, you know, from the education side, which is, 
your strong your strong suit and you know um and i again we they're 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 both they go go hand in hand i yeah. listen i agree and you know i do i do i i told you guys about when i worked on that other side of the state and how amazing those buildings were but anyway we can talk offline about that yeah you know and just to to kind of i think that this in in some ways relates to the point that joe is making um you know if you if, if you look at well next year is going to be a very interesting challenge at this time in that our debt services sees a um a, a decrease of one and a half million dollars so before we even start the budget discussion um our debt services is reduced by one and a half million dollars that opens up that will open up a lot of questions about you know what does that mean for the ram budget and what does it mean for our capital budget um as Joe mentioned, we have items certainly like the roof. We have items mm -hmm. like pillars that are are high priced items. We, you know, I think the board. I think you guys have done a phenomenal job of of working with the capital budget to get a lot done. But you know, there are some capital items that dwarf anything that you know we've been able to um, successfully tackle over the last few years. The roof and boy. So so I've heard that about, um, you know, uh, uh, about how that will look different um, next year. Or there'll be kind of an opportunity. Has that conversation been occurring with um, the three boards of finance? Not yet, Judy, no. Because, because it really, I, I think... Um, I think especially given those circumstances, it really is an important time to have that conversation because as, I don't know who said it, you and Joe maybe or someone else, um, but, you know, we have to pay for building up, keep building maintenance to keep facilities and there are a couple of ways of doing it. And we've dealt with bonding and I'm not sure how much people love it. There's some challenges with that as we know. So it seems like, um, Scott, I don't know where that falls into this, but you let us know at another board meeting or another budget workshop about that. And that it, you know, I don't know what, it, do you and Stephanie have thoughts on how to um, communicate or get input from the towns? Well, on, go ahead. I'm sorry. At this point, Stephanie and I are scheduled to meet with the, um, Marlboro Board of Finance on February 25th and the Hebron Board of Finance on March, I want to say 9th. Um, so we will be meeting with them and I'm, I'm just waiting to get um, the meeting scheduled to end over. Um, so um, we will be reviewing the budget request. But Judy, I think really the, you know, most of that time is going to be focused on reviewing the request yeah. for 20. 122 budget. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the time for that. Right. Yeah. Right. But I think we'll what, I'm, what I'm saying is now that we won't have this huge burden, it frees up, right? It frees up some money. It does. It, it has a potential to do a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that, I mean, it's, it's a conversation somewhere because as you and Joe and maybe others just said, there are a couple of different directions that we could we could go in, you know. I you know my, my suggestion would be once we finish with this budget season, that you know we at least begin to start asking the question, you know, what might we, what direction might we want to go in this area? I, I think sense, it, Scott. I think it, I think it would be a mistake to wait until this time next year. And, I do too. Oh, you know, because because we're not going to make the thoughtful decision, you know, if we start thinking, if we, if we make it in a month, as opposed to thinking about it for the next, you know, 10 months. Does everybody else think that makes sense? I think that makes sense. And I, that's what I was trying to ask. It feels too messy to throw in right, right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't right. think it's appropriate at those meetings, but um, to maybe wrap up this budget and then really begin that robust conversation. Okay. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, Judy, Judy, that's that's kind of why I brought it up. I mean, it's it's you know we're we're doing a lot of great things. I think when how we the administration and their teams are working with budgeting, like I already mentioned, that's a couple of areas. But we're going to be, uh, you know, challenged. Like Scott has already, I think we've already, everybody kind of knows it, but I think our, our, our track history has proven that we are more um, reactionary than we are uh, proactive on how we plan. And I'm just throwing it out there to the board um, that there are some significant items that are coming uh, that, you know, when we've reduced the debt, that you're going to have, even though you reduce debt, you're going to have to look at what are you going to replace it with because, you know, we're going to have a roof. We're going to have other um, yeah. timingly events that pop, you know, th equipment fails. Um, and we've done a very good job, I think, over the years of when those circumstances arise that we, you know, we, we're lucky that we have additional funds to pay, offset them. But um, I look at the, you know, the, the 20, the, the, the long range budget is, mm -hmm. It's pretty surmountable that how and then we we do need to have a conversation this year after budget to plan and mm -hmm. maybe come up with some um, scenarios for the three towns to say look uh, in five yeah. years this is this is what we're going to be looking at that's all no right. that's I I mean from my perspective that's kind of what I thought you were saying and that's why I asked those questions there are good questions yeah. okay good. Are there any other questions at this point? Okay. Um, Stephanie, not a question, but just wondering and in, in planning and kind of like what Judy said, all the other things that RAM does, that they do it well. Um, but thinking off of uh, coming out of a pandemic, are there additional staffing needs, supports for our students if we do return back? in hopefully in September to a, a full model. And, you know, are those things gonna cost, um, a, are they gonna be additional additions to, to the budget? Um, and I wanna be sure that, you know, we are not gonna be able to make up everything. It's, it's humanity, but we do need to give our best effort for our students. And I don't know if that, I'm sure Scott, you've had conversations with staff about that, but I don't know if it's indica indi indicated in the budget, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kathleen. And, and you know, looking ahead at, at next year, as far as the instructional side of coming back from COVID, um, you know, we, we're, we're well, okay, I, I, I've got to be careful how I say this, but, you know, our decreasing enrollment does provide some, um, some benefits here in that our current level of programming allows us to do a lot that we might not have been able to do should we be looking at an increase in, in enrollment or, um, or a steady enrollment. So, you know, we believe that the resources that we have in place are, are adequate to, um, to get us through. And we are looking at, I think it's it, like the ESSER grant is the perfect opportunity to provide those additional resources that, um, you know, that, that aren't in the budget. So I think that by utilizing what is already in place and by utilizing some of these additional budget to, um, grant items, um, we will be able to take our kids and, and take them where they need to go. Yeah. That's that's good to hear. And I hope there's also um, supports for students, social, emotional and behavioral needs, adaptive needs. And, um, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, how you're going to measure all that. And I, I know I've had a conversation with you, too, about, um, you know, I'm worried about those those kiddos and their GPAs in in high school and the effects, the long term effects. Uh, of, you know, this year and potentially next year and trying to catch up. So I, I want to make sure that we continue to, you know, support those kids who this year wasn't their best year and I don't want it to change their future. Um, it's not their fault, you know. You know, it, and it's, 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 it's an interesting conundrum because, you know, you, we, we have the new graduation requirements, which means that kids, you know, are, are really filling up their schedule. So, you know, there's not much room in the day to, like, even if we were going to hire, let's say, you know, we had the um, ability and we hired a, a slew of new teachers. 
it's not as if our students have lots of time to be able to, you know, take advantage of all that. So I think that the more um, targeted um, supports that we're able to put in place are, are going to serve us well. Absolutely. And individualizing that, uh, you know, students are uh, humans and individuals, they might need different things. And uh, I know the staff will be looking out for them. I, you know, yep. um, they've done a great job this year. And I know they're aware of the, the, the students that need more supports. Mm -hmm. Anyone else with any questions or comments? And again, please feel free to, to email any, um, any questions that you may have. Um, I will share before our next meeting the presentations for the coordinators so you'll have all that information for you. Um, and certainly any other adjustments or updates um, on the current document. Great, thank you, Scott, and thank you for uh, to everyone who um, did presentations tonight. And um, I guess we'll move on to public comments. Yes, yes, I would have some if you don't mind. Go ahead, Dieter. Okay, because this numbers coming up to increase capital increase and so on, I just like to mention certain numbers which Malbo have to deal with. For example, right now for the current year, Malbo is paying a levy for 10,300,000. With your proposed, which is great that you're coming up with 2.2% increase. However, that means for Malbo, 11 million 200 um, thousand and that is a 900 thousand dollar increase keeps us in mind and this would be about 8.5 increase for Marble just only if you're coming in this is 2.2 percent increase also Marble is in bad shape this year again <laughs> but on the other hand, if you look at your debt service, Joe, you mentioned you have to look in the future with bigger items. Yes, in the debt service, you will have a saving from one and a half million coming up in the year 22, 23. And there you can already uh, figure out what else you can do with that. Um, to buy capital equipment, one-time purchases. And this is just only my concerns about increases and what Marlboro have to pay. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dieter. Is there anybody else who'd like to um, comment from the public? And I'm hearing none at this time. So we'll go to adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. This is Kathleen. Second. And this is Mary. I'll second it. Is there any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is that an eye from everyone? Opposed? Okay, meeting adjourned at 8.58 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank good night, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, thank Scott. you. Everybody. Scott, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Great, thank you, Dieter. Okay. Is it possible I can, or is it already on the website, the presentation from your teachers?